Over to you, Dr. Puna. Thank you, Brother Didi Chuan. Please give me a moment while I share the screen. Okay. All right. Good evening, Dhamma family, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Today is the 24th, uh, the second last of the series. Forgive me for that number, don't worry about that number. But we have reached the second last of our series and it has been a wonderful time sharing the Dhamma over the last six months. We started with Subang Jaya and over the six months, very rapidly, had another 15 more groups joining us. And that is something I am extremely, extremely grateful for because we have managed to unite a group of Buddhist societies into a single platform. As I said, today is the 24th and the second last of this series. And we have got a good following over the last six months of almost 4,000 people every Friday night. And as I mentioned before, we will try our best not to disappoint anyone, but to continue even when this series ends. So today we are going to talk on a topic which Buddhists are not at all shy or fearful of talking, and that we are talking about a good death. And while we may use words like transmigration, reincarnation, rebirth, recycle, all these words were chosen by the various interpreters over the last centuries based on their background and their understanding. But a very good word is actually transit. The word transit, as in your airport transit launch, is an excellent word, excellent word to describe this process. Now, it is not that Buddhists believe or don't believe in rebirth. It is simply that we don't believe in death. Death is not the end. And this is one of the fundamental teachings of the Buddha. One of the key principles the Buddha taught is the teaching of Kamma. And his teaching is radically different from what was existent 2,600 years ago when the Buddha walked the earth. But the Buddha teaches that we are all heirs of our karma. And I keep saying that while we might look at karma as a very exotic word, something almost magical or mythical, karma, the Buddha said, merely means chetana, merely means our actions. We are the heirs of our action. All our intention, action are seeds for the future. We have karma creating those that we will love, those that we will be together. We have karma as our home. And also we have karma that will determine what we will be. And again, I wish to emphasize, please do not look at it as some magical thingy. Karma is basically our action. What you do today will determine what will happen to us tomorrow, the week, next week, the next month, the next year, the next life. What we do today is going to have a big influence. And it is because what we do today plants seeds for the future. I just had a wonderful lunch this afternoon with many of my students. And I had always shared that if we are to teach metta to students, let us not teach it with words. We can talk till the cows come home, 
about meta, about unconditional love, about may you be happy, may you be well. We can talk and talk and talk, but actions are so much more effective. If we are going to talk about con unconditional love, then let us show unconditional love. If we are going to talk about kindness, then let us live it in our lives, not just by words. When we show kindness or unconditional love to whoever they may be, we will have taught a lesson so loud that nobody can hear the words because actions speak so much louder than words. The students who were with me this afternoon came from a mixture of various religious backgrounds. And I told them that the Buddha taught us to have metta for all beings. He taught us to have metta, which is unconditional love. And we say, may all beings be happy and well. The Buddha did not say, may Buddhists be happy and well. Or may Theravada Buddhists be happy and well. Or may Mahayana or Vajrayana or whatever. He said, may all beings be happy and well. And this includes Buddhists, non-Buddhists, or people of whatever faith, whatever religion. We show metta, karuna, equally. And in doing that, we have actually planted a seed. That coming action will determine the future. That coming action might seem a small seed now, but even the biggest tree comes from a small seedling, a small little sprout. So it is the same with our lives. What we do now will determine the next hour. And what we may do now may appear tiny, inconsequential, but we can never tell. An hour from now, we have all been reborn. We are all different beings. We are an hour older. And tomorrow when we wake up, you have again been reborn. You are again another being. Death is no different. It is just another day. So while the early translators use words like transmigration and reincarnation, in the present context, these are poor choices of words. It's, its implication is wrong because the implication of transmigration or reincarnation means that there is something that has transmigrated or reincarnated. The Buddha's teaching is very clear. There is no such thing. There is continuity of a process. So there is continuity that one gave rise to the other. Just like what we do today will give rise to consequences tomorrow and in the future. So for lack of a better word, we often use rebirth. But even rebirth is not a very good word because it means something solid is born again. Of course, we can also interpret it differently, that this is just a process, that you die in inverted commas, and then you come again. So to come again, you have to be reborn. In modern parlance, another word is recycled. We are all recycled. The nitrogen, the carbon in our bodies came from stars which died billions of years ago. Every atom in our body is recycled from something else. So whatever choice of words we use, whatever choose, whatever the words chosen finally, the understanding is that is continuation. It does not end at death. From one arises another, just like from this lunch arises another being with all the food that I ate, 
And from today will arise tomorrow another being that is a continuation of what I am. So we understand that there is continuation from one, when the person dies, arises another. So to say that the other is completely the same is wrong because it is not the same. To say that the one is completely different is also wrong because the other one, the next one, came about as a result of this one. So there is continuation from one arise another. And the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh used a very good word when he said, death is actually transit. I think that's an excellent choice of words with our present understanding of the word transit. We are born of our actions. We are the heir of our actions. We will transit to another form based on all our actions. So if someone stops you at the bus stop and asks you, brother or sister, who is your creator? You can confidently tell, my creator is all my actions. All the seeds that I've planted, my karma. That's why the Buddha taught us, we are born of our karma. We are the owners of our karma. We are the heir of our karma. We have karma as the seed. So this very important teaching is taught in Paticca Samupada, a dependent origination. And that everything is coming into existence because of causes and conditions. And this is something important for us to realize that our actions that we did this morning does not simply disappear. With the right conditions, it will ripen in the afternoon or tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. It doesn't just disappear. And similarly, at what we call death, our karmic seeds continues to form a new being. There is continuation. A new being is caused into existence. The Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh explains it very simply. He said, imagine a white cloud that we all see in the sky. And then it begins to rain. And because of the rain, that cloud is no more there. And simplistic mind will say, oh, the cloud is no more there. It's gone. But the real truth is that the cloud is in the rain. It is impossible for that cloud to die or to disappear. That cloud can become rain, snow, hailstones, ice, anything. But it cannot be nothing. It has transformed into various forms. But it is not dead or nothing, or disappear. This, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, is also what happens to us when we die. While we, with limited understanding, will see it as the end, those who understand, will understand, who sen, who miet, who go, who jing, who zen, who jian. In reality, nothing is born or destroyed. Nothing is created. Nothing is any highlighted. Nothing is added. Nothing is subtracted. It merely transforms into another state, another form. And any student of physics will tell you the exact same laws of physics. That energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but merely transformed into other states. So what have we done in our life? What is this karma? What are these actions that we have done? What is this painting that we have been painting all our life? Every day we are painting on this huge fresco. Is it a meaningful life? Is it something that has been well used, this life? So it's not just about being rich or popular 
but it is about being able to help, to love, to touch someone, to be better people, to help a student, to help an elderly, to help a handicap, to help a needy. Metta, karuna, in action. And the Buddha said, even death is not to be feared by one who has lived wisely. So if you understand the Buddha Dharma, you are freed. You are freed from human and divine bondage. No longer are you threatened by the pain of hell or the fire and brimstone of hell. No wonder people fear. No longer are you bright with the carrot of heaven. Just now you know you are freed from all such human and divine bondage. You create your own heaven. You create your own hell. And that is why, while well, the word religio in Latin means literally to tie you, to bind you, the Buddha Dharma, in great contrast, frees you because it wants you to understand and to know. Now, many people had asked me about a good death. And I promised Brother Leong that I will talk about it today. Now, you must realize that death is an event. You cross a door. But sickness and dying is a process. It is not an event. And it is not death which is frightening. It is dying which is frightening. And this is something every one of us that I am sharing with now, I hope you understand. I restate it. Death is only one moment in time, an event, while sickness and dying is a process which can last an hour, a week, or even a month. And it is not death which is frightening. It is dying which is something that we need to do something about. So for this reason, all of us need our spiritual well-being to be taken care of as much as our physical well-being when we are sick or when we are dying. And in fact, for the dying person, taking care of the spiritual well-being is even more important than the physical well-being. Now, being ill being sick and dying are not conditions that are negative in and of themselves. It is normal to fall sick and all of us will undergo dying. It is just nature. By itself, it's neither good nor bad. It is just nature. And the Buddha's teachings on how we approach illness and dying is broadly when you see someone who is sick or dying, help to incline the person's mind to sada. Now, sada is a very difficult word to translate to English. Traditionally, it is translated as fate. But that's a, a, not a good word because sada really doesn't mean blind fate. Sada means more closer to confidence knowing that the Buddha is correct, confidence in the Dhamma and the Sangha. So incline this man's mind to Sada in the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha. And in all the good deeds that he has done and in all the precepts that he has kept, because this is good and wholesome. And the second thing, to help him let go of worries and all the material things. Having seen with wisdom, a person will know that there is nothing that he can cling on to. If a person has not seen with wisdom, then it is extremely difficult for the person to let go of his material possessions and attachments. This is something you need to do now to learn and to have 
the eye of wisdom to realize that there is nothing that you can hold on to beyond your karma, beyond all the goodness and wholesome things that you have done. You are born, we are born naked. We will similarly go naked. No material possessions can accompany us. So please remember, the Buddha's teachings is never blind faith or empty promises. That's why I prefer to use the word sada, untranslated. Because if you use the word faith, then people may misunderstand. Because the Buddha's teaching is never blind faith. Neither is there empty promises. There is no such promise that if you believe in him, you will be saved, or you will be cured, or you will have eternal life, etc., etc. You will find nothing of the sort in the pristine Buddha Dharma. Because all those are nice things that people want to hear, but anyone will, with wisdom and reflection, will realize that it is not true. If by prayer, by faith, one can be cured of all diseases, there will be no sick people on earth. No one will die. And the faith healers should be in hospitals instead of in religious institutions. And everyone will be in heaven. And everyone will look pretty. So it is obviously not true. For example, you may be promised heaven. Who wants to go to heaven? Everybody will say, yeah, I want to go to heaven. Now you ask that same question, would you want to go to heaven now? No one will. None. That first statement is merely something people say to reassure, to console themselves, because none of them really believe it. So the reality, and this is what the Buddha teaches, is that life is a terminal disease with 100% mortality. And in fact, this is something the Buddha reminds us to constantly reflect on, that life is impermanent. It is non-self. We cannot control it. And that every one of us will die. Good health is merely the slowest way to die. Kevin and Hobbes here. Kevin says, I don't understand this business about death. If you are just going to die, what's the point of living? Kevin says. So first, Kevin must understand. It is not that it will end. It continues. We do not need to wish for eternal life. We are already in eternal life. And that is something fundamental that people do not realize. To die well, to transit well, one must have lived well. So now, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, I've already spoken for 20 minutes on this. And now you realize that you are dying. As all of us are. Today, I have already used one day. I am one day closer. My lifespan is one day shorter for this life. Now that you know that you are dying, as all of us are, would you not be nicer, love more, be a bit more adventurous in your life? Don't save it for tomorrow. Use that cup today. Eat that food, that abalone you save in one, for one year in your kitchen cabinet for your children to come home and eat. Use it now. Now death, when we realize it, when we see it, especially of someone that you know can be a very harsh but an effective teacher to make us become better human beings. Because when you see it, especially in someone you know, you realize how true the teachings of the Buddha are. No empty promises, no false reassurance, just reality. So the Buddha has taught us that death is certain. Our time of death is uncertain. It's impermanent. And at the time of death, 
Only our spiritual practice can help us. Nothing else. The fact is death is natural. And once you realize this, you need not fear it. Embrace it. So it is not impermanence that makes us suffer. It is our rejection of impermanence. That is what makes us suffer. What makes us suffer is we want things to be permanent when they are not permanent. When you use a cup, realize it's already broken. When you use a new computer, realize that it will be spoiled. Then you enjoy using it at every moment because you know that it getting spoiled, the cup getting broken, is just a natural process. So His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, has taught us, you want a good death? We cannot hope to die peacefully if our lives are full of violence, if our minds are always agitated. To die well, we must learn to live well. Have a peaceful mind, a peaceful death. So now is the time to learn stillness while we are still alive. Now, in this time and age, we are lucky because dying in the most comfortable way is possible. And when you are with the sick and the very ill, even if you do not know what to say, just holding them in a gentle way will let them feel the love you have for them. And our things, there are things that, of course, we want so that we can transit in peace and dignity. One, being free. Most people now with modern medication can die pain-free. And you will want to die at home rather than in a hospital environment. At home where your family, friends, kayanamitas can be with you. And let us begin openly acknowledging it. There's nothing to be embarrassed that we are critically ill. Resolve personal conflicts. And very important, have the opportunity to seek forgiveness, to forgive and to express love. And for those of us who are visiting or for the person who is dying, if he has experience in meditation, his mind can be calm, can be still. And for the visitor, if your mind can be calm and still, you can radiate metta. And that is very powerful. That peacefulness, that stillness has an energy which even a dying person or a comatose patient is able to feel. Now death is part of life. Let's accept that. Let's talk about it. Let's not deny it. Let's feel that advanced medical directive which I've already sent to you. Let's let the next generation or let Kayanamitas know. Ask Kayanamitas, keep a copy of my advanced medical directive, my living will, so that you will be able to help me when I'm in that stage. My spouse may be too upset but you are my kayanamitas, my spiritual friends. You can play a huge role in filling up that gap that I will need very much at that point in time. So death is only the final stage of this life. Please read this only child story while I drink some water. This, of course, is just a story, but it is to illustrate a point of continuation, a point that you and I will come back to those that you love. And also, I have to say, 
to those that you do not love or even worse hate. So let go of the hatred because you might be together with that person because of that emotional bond. It goes both ways. Now, the formal Chinese word for death actually is a perfect translation of the word transit. Death formally is Wang Shen. You know, this word means literally to move on to another life. As in, Sunra, happy birthday, my birthday. Death is literally moving on to another life. So where there is birth, there was the death before it. Where there is birth, there is the, sorry, where there is death, there will be the birth after it. And every day, not just our birthday, is really our continuation day. Happy continuation day to every one of us here. And when we die, as the great Elizabeth Cooper Ross wrote, tell my children to celebrate. Release balloons in the sky. Because for me, I have graduated in this life. I will now proceed to my career in the next. Look at it this way. It is a graduation from this life to the next. Let us hope we have learned our spiritual lessons well so that we can continue using it in the next career move. So let's see how we can help friends. And my Kayana meters, please listen to this well. How do you help friends? Now, if a patient does not have long to live, I think it is imperative that we must let them know. Because in our culture, there are still people who don't even know. And this deprives them of that opportunity to prepare mentally, materially, and to express their wishes and to say things they might want to say. So I think it is very important that we must let those who are terminally ill realize this fact and be prepared for it. Because this empowers them to decide if they had not already decided, what do they want? Do they want to go home? Or do they want to be kept alive by all means? Do they want a feeding tube put into their nose to the tummy? Or do they want to be just left in peace, free from pain? So this is something that we must not deprive them of. If possible, keep the ancient tradition to die at home, in familial surroundings, with familial people, loved ones, descendants, kayanamitas surrounding them. And in fact, it could be like in this picture, an event, a celebration of a life that is well lived. We all deserve this right to die with grace, dignity, and the support of Kayana meters and family and loved ones. Not in a busy hospital, not in an environment where you are just a case number or a bed number. So let us live well here and now. The time to live is not tomorrow or yesterday, but now. Let us use that time well. To die happy, we must have lived a life well lived. And every one of us can be great because every one of us can do that. Even if it is something so simple as just washing the plates at the center, or helping run dhamma sharing, moderating, providing IT support. Everyone can do this, and it can touch innumerable lives. So let us help the person who is ill 
focus his mind on all the good deeds that he has done in his life. Reassure him he has been a good, wholesome life, lots of dana, lots of help, and these good deeds will be with you all the way. These good deeds will be your companions. The Buddha had taught us, Kamma is the only thing. We are the heir. We are the born of the Kamma, created by the Kamma, and that will accompany us. And again, the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh wrote this, when someone wanted to build a shrine, a stupa for him, Many of you will know that the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh is in very poor health. And he has gone back to his home temple in Vietnam, awaiting transit. And of course, his students, thousands of them, they wanted to build a stupa for him when he finally transits. And he said, please, do not build a stupa for me. Do not put my ashes in a vase. Lock me inside and limit who I am. Yes, I know it's difficult for some of you. So if you must build a stupa, please make sure you put a sign, I am not in here. And you put another sign that says, I am not out there either. And the third sign that says, if I am anywhere, it is in your mindful breathing and in your peaceful steps. Now, this is very profound. He is trying to teach. Do not be attached. He has continued. He has transited. So technically, he is not in there. But his ashes, of course, are there. But the most important thing is what has he done in his life. And he has taught his whole life. So if any of that teaching carries on, he lives in you. He lives through you and via you. So, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, let us all, every one of us, no matter how old we are, make the rest of our lives the best. Let us do wholesome things. Let us just welcome a student from somewhere and let him know, yes, we care for you. You're not all alone. Let us just help someone who is hungry now because of COVID. Simple things we can do. Academic and monetary achievements don't matter much in the winter of our lives. And the Buddha had taught in the Dhammapada, many do not realize that we here must die. For those who realize this, swan lapa. Whatever quarrels also, forget it. Forget it. Walk away. It is not worth it. So gratitude is meaningless if it is not put into practice. Remember, the very first lesson the Buddha gave after his enlightenment is the lesson of gratitude when the Buddha showed his gratitude to the Bodhi tree. Now, gratitude without action is the same as metta without love or compassion. I feel sorry to see so many poor people suffering. May they be well. And then we do nothing about it. Just words. That is not metta. Metta is a verb. So the practice of a Buddhist is not just self-cultivation, but also the practice of metta and karuna for the welfare of others and doing something for it. I ask fellow doctors, can you teach? And they say, yes, of course we can teach. Then can you teach for free to students who want to learn? That is meta in action. You are giving a skill, a knowledge. You are giving your time, which is priceless, for the welfare of others. Seek closure, resolve quarrels, forgive and forget about it. And this is one of the cause of sufferings that prevents people from dying peacefully. So we have to learn to let go. Important words, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, 
I love you. Learn to say them now. Now the Buddha taught us that when you give spiritual guidance to the dying, help them recollect and have faith in the triple gem. Establish them in the goodness that they have done in their sada and in all their dana and in all their good words, works. And after that, the next step is to help them to let go of all their concerns, even of parents, children, spouse, and possessions. And this may sound extremely difficult to many of us. So Kayana meters can help the dying person to let go by reassuring them that children, descendants will be taken care of, or the children themselves can reassure the father or the grandparents that we are all independent and capable. We can take care of ourselves. And for those with living parents, reassure them that their parents will be well taken care of so that they can let go of these attachments. Now the Buddha on record in the suttas in Anga Anguttara Nikaya, this teachings was put into action. Nakula Pita, or Nakula's father, was very sick. Nakula's mother, Nakula Mata, said to him, Householder, don't pass away with concerns. Such concern is suffering and is criticized by the Buddha. You may think when you are gone, I'm not able to provide for the children or keep up whatever. But don't worry. I am capable. I'm able to do all this. So don't pass away with concerns. When death approaches, there's nothing better than to let go of everything, including the notion of self. And remember, when you learn about Upadana, you will learn that the notion of self is one of the strongest attachments. We have to realize the delusion of self, of a concrete, unchanging self, of an indestructible, eternal self. Learn that now, that you are just a process that is continually evolving and that there is no permanent self. And if you can let go of this attachment or upadana, then you will have crossed another threshold into awakening. So some people die suddenly with a very short period. And that, of course, makes it difficult to go through what we just discussed. So while you are healthy, be mentally prepared. While some have a very prolonged dwindling phase in which, of course, people accept it well and the person have more opportunities to do what we just said. Now, filial or xiao sun. Let us do this when the person is alive, not when the person is dead. And the Chinese word, when you have xiao, all your activities will be soon. This is a very profound teaching. We have to learn to change our thinking. Just take a look at this note. Everyone will say, ah, this is a hell note. No, look carefully. This is not a hell note. This is a heaven note. So we have to learn to change our thinking. You create your heaven. You create your hell. So medical treatment for people near the end of their lives should only be that which provides comfort, pain-free states that is appropriate and proportionate. No heroics, preferably no resuscitation. And you've got to make this very clear. It is so simple. All we need at the end of life is comfort care. And we want the mind not to be sick. Even at the end, remember, 
do not expect your children to behave in preset patterns of thought. No one is perfect because why? We are also not perfect. So why should our children behave in a perfect way according to what you think? And I like this picture because one of the most common things I see is elderly ladies coming to complain to me that, oh, yo, why my son like that? Oh, why my daughter like that? Oh, why my daughter-in-law like that? Why are they not behaving like that? Very preconceived thoughts on how they must act or should act or be like. The reality is they are different people raised in a different environment, in a different culture, with a different education. There is no way they will be the same as us. So yes, your children may not be perfect by your definition. And why should they be? Even you are not perfect. Even I am not perfect. None of us are perfect. So let us accept this reality. Now it is important to create a peaceful environment at home. So the last thing you need is people quarreling over your assets. The last thing you need is people shoving you left and right saying, don't die, don't die, don't die. That's the last thing that you need. Place in the room a Buddha image. Make it a temple and not a sick room. Help the patient if he is unable to, to pay homage, to take refuge, to recite the precepts. And Kayana meters can do this well. And for those who have been sick for a long time, get someone to read his favorite suttas to him. Or nowadays, just play it for him. Reading is better because playing is so impersonal. And invite monks, especially those whom he knows, whom he has a connection to, visit, talk, counsel. This will put the mind state into a wholesome state of mind. And very important, when the body is broken, death is actually a happier option. Give the person that final relief. Give him permission. Let him be free. I love you and will miss you dearly. But I don't want to see you suffer anymore. So if you would like to go now, it is all right. I give you permission to live. You may not be easy for you to say this, but it is something very important and very helpful if you are able to. Now in hospitals, doctors, nurses will follow standard protocols and do whatever they can. It will be a chaotic environment. So to avoid that, we have to give advance notice. You do not need a doctor when you are dying. I do not need a doctor when I'm dying. But I need an amicus mortis. And this was a role doctors played for hundreds of years until modern technology took over. Amicus means friend. Mortis means death. You need a friend at death to help you be comfortable, be pain-free, and not heroics. And I like this picture here, which illustrates a doctor here playing a completely different role. An amicus mortis. In Ling, you are listening to this talk. One day, hopefully not too soon, you can be an amicus mortis to me. So in summary, we all want to pass to transit without pain. We want to have the opportunity to say, I'm sorry, let's forget it, let's forgive and forget. We want it to be stress-free, to transit with friends, family, loved ones, your pet, and you want to have control over where, as I say, a familial environment where you can literally convert into a temple is the best. The opportunity to say goodbye.
So saying goodbye may not be natural. So don't wait until the last minute. A lot of people have regrets. And the important messages are very simple. Please forgive me. I forgive you. Thank you. I love you. That's it. Reassure the dying person you understand. Give him permission. I already told you, reassure him that he has lived a life well lived. Sometimes a person may ask, am I dying? And sometimes the person there may have difficulty. They don't know how to respond. So you can say, I don't know. How are you feeling now? Or you look tired. Please don't worry about us. If you need to rest, it's okay. These are words that you may say if you really find it difficult. Remember, brothers and sisters, the enemy is not death. The enemy is needless, pointless suffering in the dying process. So, Kayana meters, please allow your Dhamma family to die peacefully, surrounded by loved ones, to create a wholesome and positive atmosphere that will transit to a good rebirth. No resuscitation, no heroics. The art of dying is basically the art of living. All these beautiful things that you see, they are beautiful to be enjoyed now. But none of these accumulated wealth are really yours or mine. We just use it now, enjoy it and pass it on to another person. And having lived a good life, there is no need to cry when death comes. It is a good death, a life well lived, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, is long enough. And I'm now going to show you a short video clip, as I promised Brother Leong that I will. Death, whereby a person dies in relative comfort, without pain, without death, Christian whereby a person in, dies in relative die comfort, without pain, without secretion struggling him, such that he can die mindfully, peacefully, with the mind in a state that is wholesome, recalling good deeds, recalling wholesome acts, and if possible, meditating, that is living in that present moment. And good death is a death that encompasses not just that, but also a death with dignity, i.e. a death that is natural without all sorts of tubes and needles being inserted in the body and a death without regrets which would mean that the person is able to pass on without feeling guilty fear of things done or things not done that is said things not said things that should have been done but are done or things that should not have been done but then, so all these things would require that we actually start preparing for it now and not at the moment of death because the time of death is really unpredictable as to the first part death without pain medicine in the 21st century is able to provide most people with relatively comfortable deaths death is an event such dying process is a process and we want to make that dying process as smooth, as comfortable, such that the patient himself and his attending family members are not distressed, or rather minimally distressed if we can achieve that. As for the 
second part of death with doubt, regrets. That is something we need to start doing now, living a good life, living a life that is meaningful, meaning a life of significance rather than a life of materialism. In the end, what really matters is not what we label ourselves as whatever tradition or religion, but what we have done with our lives. And if we have lived a good life, then that is a good life that has been led. And like someone who has worked well in the day, he deserves a good night's sleep. That would be just a door to another one more state of existence. All right. Okay, I apologize. I was informed that there's a fair bit of echo and I'll try and run it one more time. Hopefully without the echo. Death, whereby a person dies in relative comfort without pain, without secretions troubling him, such that he can die mindfully, peacefully, with the mind in a state that is wholesome, recalling good deeds, recalling wholesome acts, and if possible, meditating, that is living in that present moment. And a good death is a death that encompasses not just that, but also a death with dignity, i.e. a death that is natural without all sorts of tubes and needles being inserted in the body and a death without regrets which should mean that the person is able to pass on without feeling guilty or fear of things done or things not done that is said things not said things that should have been done but undone or things that should not have been done but done so all these things would require that we actually start preparing for it now and not at the moment of death because the time of death is really unpredictable as to the first part death without pain medicine in the 21st century is able to provide most people with relatively comfortable deaths death is an event the dying process is a process and we want to make that dying process as smooth, as comfortable, such that the patient himself and his attending family members are not distressed or rather minimally distressed if we can achieve that. As for the second part of death with doubt, regrets, that is something we need to start doing now, living a good life, living a life that is meaningful meaning a life of significance rather than a life of materialism. In the end, what really matters is not what we label ourselves as whatever tradition or religion, but what we have done with our lives. And if we have lived a good life, then that is a good life that has been led. And like someone who has worked well in the day, he deserves a good night's sleep. That would be just a door to another one more state of existence. All right. All right. I passed it back to Brother Chuan now. Yeah. Sahadu, Sahadu, Sahadu. That that was a really very interesting talk. Wow, uh, I cut uh, some of the uh, terms that you use and then the advice. Make the rest of our lives the best. Doing wholesome deeds and not just material successful things. That's what we always do and we're very common. Yeah. And, and the uh, practice of Buddhists is not just self-cultivation, but also the practice of metta and karuna. Then I find it very difficult is seeking closure, forgive and forget and just say sorry, I'm sorry. Well, we have to learn that to, to make it easy for all of us. So now it's question and answer time. 
Well, I, I was uh, going uh, listening uh, to your talk, and then the, we we pass away, we go, and then we are reborn again. I'm thinking is that uh, if is that's the case, why is it that uh, most of us cannot remember uh, our previous life then, since the reborn is so fast? Uh, what you put well. There are people who could recall their past lives, as you know. Professor Ian Stevenson made a career very respectably and became mm. professor at his university, spending an entire lifetime investigating these past life recollections. And almost all of these people who could recollect their past lives will lose memory of it by the time they reach about five, six, and maximum by about 12 years old, they would yeah. have forgotten. It. And so where there is definitely lots of evidence of people who can mm. recollect their past lives with remarkable accuracy. And Professor Ian Stevenson is a scientist and not even a Buddhist. And every time someone in any part of the world remembers this, his whole team will fly over, interview, document, and then visit the place, go back to the old village or etc., wherever the person claimed, and investigate. And it is only in those situations where they can verify that they will report. And so Professor Ian Stevenson has since retired, but his team has continued doing these good works. And you can read all about it in the books that you can buy actually documents many of these people. Now, the other one is why uh, past life regression. Mm -hmm. And past life regression is something that has come in in the last 10 years or so. And they are also very respectable people doing it. I know a surgeon in Singapore who is a full-time surgeon at Singapore General Hospital who is also qualified in past life regression therapy and it is people who are referred to him from the psychiatric department with all kinds of issues that cannot be solved that this doctor peter mack actually uses past life regression to try and solve their problems if you are interested and there is time i can even play you a video which he so kindly passed to me whereby he actually documented someone with permission, of course, as he put her into past life regression. Mm -hmm. And with past life regression, people are able to actually recall their past lives. So it is not that we have forgotten, it's that we can't recall it. It is in our memory somewhere. And of course, I think most people here will know of Professor Brian Wise, Brian Weiss is a Jewish man who was professor of psychiatry at the University of Florida. And he too, in the later stages of his career, spent almost his, all his effort doing past life regression therapy. And his book, if I remember rightly, Many Lives, Many Masters, document one such patient, names change, of course, as he regressed her over a period of one year. And this patient, renamed Katrin, went through, if I remember rightly, almost 60 over past lives. Wow. So it is now coming into mainstream consciousness. And of course, everyone I know will tell me, including Peter Mack, you do not do it unless there's a problem. So um, you cannot just do it for fun just to see where I was last time. Uh, the reason one Ajahn told me is that because you will not be able to handle the information. So even this Ajahn that I'm familiar with will tell us, even I know I will not tell because you will not be able to handle that information and you will not be able to predict how that information is going to influence you. So it is because of all these various reasons that these are now happening. And I repeat, for those who are really interested, Professor Ian Stevenson, is one person very respected in the medical community and you can read his works are quite scientific so you need to have a scientific basis 
but Professor Brian Wise's books, Many Masters, Many Lives, are written actually for the general public. And they are very readable. And so you will know this. And as I said, with regards to past life regression, if we have time, I'll show you one video that Peter Mack passed to me where he actually recorded it. And it was first shown at one of the global conferences. And I tell you, when it was first shown at the global conference, there were almost a thousand people in the hall. You can hear a pin drop as he played this video. You can literally hear a pin drop because everybody, of course, that time it was something new and everybody was so fascinated. Okay, thanks, Brother Tuan. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question that comes in. Ah, this is from KCBA, Brother W.H. Chan. What's your advice to a Dharma practitioner during the dying moment at his dying bed? Keep contemplating of the pain, body feeling or thoughts, meditating, or keep recalling all the good deeds he has done, or keep chanting or contemplating on the seven factors of enlightenment. What's your advice on this? Okay. For me to answer this question will take some time because, as you know, there are so many aspects that are written here. Okay. So I will answer based on a few important things. And the first thing I'm going to say is not going to make me very popular. I have said this before and it has made people upset. And the first thing I will say is I can tell you for a fact, if you look at the Nikayas, you will see that this very common practice that we do today of chanting the Bojanga Sutta to someone who is sick or dying, when that person does not understand the Bojanga Sutta, is not done during the Buddha's time, nor recorded in the Nikayas. If you look at the Nikayas, there were three instances where the Bojanga Sutta was chanted. And in all these three instances, the people who listened to it were Arahants. They know exactly what the seven factors of enlightenment are. If you chant the Bojanga Sutta to me in Pali, it may be something very foreign to me, and neither do I understand it well. So I repeat, while it is very popular nowadays that when someone is sick and people visit, they chant the Bojanga Sutta, there is actually no canonical basis for it. What is in the canon? The three times that I'm aware of where the Bojanga Sutta was actually chanted, all three were Arahants who knew these seven factors of enlightenment. So what is in the Nikayas when someone was sick, someone was very ill? What is in the Nikayas? What is recorded was being done? No record of the chanting of the seven factors of enlightenment. Instead, either the Buddha or the Buddha will send one of his senior disciples, go and see the person, and it will be a conversation in a language which they understand, just like you and I are now talking in English. And in that conversation, the Buddha would ask either the disciple or he himself would do it, telling the person to take Sada in the Buddha Dharma Sangha to recall all the good deeds that he has done. Recall all the dana, all the precepts and everything wholesome that he or she has done. And to let go of attachments in a spoken language, not a chanting. That is why for those people who invited me to visit when they are very ill or dying, I actually do this. I actually talk to them rather than chant something. And when I do chant, it is usually helping them to take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha because that is Sada. Then we help them take the five precepts because that is the morality. Then we go to the Itipitso because we want to help them remember the qualities of the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. And if that person is familiar with any sutta, that means the person has been chanting this particular sutta. For example, he may be familiar with the Metta Sutta. Then yes, we all chant the Metta Sutta together. If he is familiar with the Sapitiyo, then we all chant the Sapitiyo together. And if, let's say if he is familiar with the Singting, 
Then we will chant the Sing Jing together. Why? Because this recalls the Dhamma. This recalls all that is wholesome to him or her. Now, the pain part. Pain is very destructive. Believe me. I've been a doctor for 30 over years. I've seen many people with pain. When you are dying, the last thing you want is pain. I personally do not believe that we should tell someone, oh, you must contemplate on the pain and look at the pain. No, it is too negative. It is too unwholesome because pain is a negative sensation. I would say, and I'm answering Dr. Salmoy now, if a person has pain, relieve that pain. If necessary, for example, patients with carcinoma pancreas, where it is so painful, give terminal sedation. Use propofol if needed, but relieve that pain because that pain would make the patient's mind unwholesome. That pain will make the patient's mind become negative. Remember what the Buddha said in the Pari Mahaparinibbana Sutta. When the Buddha himself had such bodily pains, it is only when his mind went into jhanas that he was relieved of that pain. That jhana would have taken his mind away from the consciousness of that severe pain that the Buddha had. It is believed the Buddha died finally from a centric infarct. So he would have a centric ischemia prior to that, which is very painful. You can reflect on other bodily feelings like what we are doing in our meditation. But believe me, when you're in severe pain, it will be unwholesome. So I hope I had answered Brother Chan. This is a complex question. And I hope I've not offended anyone because I know it is pretty well established in Malaysian practice to chant the Bojanga Sutta. But what I'm sharing with you is what I know from the Nikayas, what I know the Buddha and his senior disciples did when they visited people who are sick. There are many examples in the canon. What did they do when they visit someone who is very ill? All right. I think Brother Chuan, now is a good time to answer Dr. Ng Sao Moi's question because I, I saw the question popped up just now and it's related. Oh, all right, right. Yeah, they, they, these are the questions. And uh, Ng Sao Moi was asking this, when the patient are dying, Shall we date them or let them contemplate on their death? This is Dr. Ng Sao Mei is an anesthetist, a consultant anesthetist. Uh, and nowadays, of course, palliative care is much more advanced than 10, 15 years ago. And as I said, the aim is that everybody should die in comfort. Nobody should die in pain, distress. Nobody should die curled up like a ball on the bed because of severe pain. And there are some cancers which are really horrendously painful. Cancer of the pancreas is one of them. When it has spread, it is really horrendously painful. Now, in those situations, Saume, it is wonderful that we as doctors have the ability to relieve them of their pain so that they can die in peace so that they can die without the mind being so negative, pain, 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 so much pain. So you are actually doing a good job, Salmeng, when you are giving terminal sedation. Do not look. I know some doctors feel guilty when they are asked to give terminal sedation, when they are asked to give high doses of antihistamine to stop that death cuddle, that get, which is, again, very distressing. I say, please, stop that. Use whatever antihistamines we have. Dry the lungs up. Dry the airways up. You don't want that to distract the patient. So when we are doing that, for the doctors who are in this audience, you're actually doing a good job because you're helping someone transit in comfort, in peace, and in stillness. Remember, we are merely sedating the hardware. The software is not sedatable, if there is such a word. We are merely sedating the hardware so that they will transit in painless state. And I can't mm. emphasize that. We are lucky in this present age whereby we have all this. Now, all of us will die. 
none of us listening in here will live forever. All of us will go through that phase. It is perfectly all right to be relieved of pain, to be in comfort. Do not let someone tell you, oh, this is your karma, you must suffer it. No, 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 no. It is your karma to be born now, to meet Dr. Ng Sao Mei, who can relieve you of your pain. It is your karma to be born now, so that you are aware that these options are available. No one should die a painful death. Okay, Sami, I hope I have answered your question. We still haven't gone for dinner yet with Dr. Quack. We must. <laughs> okay. All, all right. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Doctor, just want to ask uh, just uh, before, uh, about your video. How many minutes will it be if we ask you to play? Oh, it's about five minutes, I think. Ah, okay, okay. We can get ready. Let's answer the next question first and then we see how. Uh, just now, uh, we have the next question. Uh, all right. From uh, Leong Yumei, why would one wants to be reborn, reincarnated, recycled, and there's no notion of a self? <laughs> Brother Yumei, I finally saw how you look like. A sister posted your picture to me, so I finally <laughs> know how you look like. <laughs> now, Brother Yumei, it is not whether we want to be reborn, reincarnated, or recycled. It is not what you and I want. It is a process. It is like now you eat salt. Okay, let's say now we and I eat a cup of Maggie Mee, you know, one of those cups, okay? So we all each eat one cup. An hour later, we feel thirsty. Both of us feel very thirsty because there's a very high salt content. So it's not whether you want it or you don't want it because we have eaten that Maggie Mee with a lot of salt. You are going to feel thirsty. And it's the same thing because we have done or not done what we have in this time that process continues. It's not that I don't want to be reborn, so okay, I'm not going to be reborn. It's not that. If you really don't want to be reborn, then you have to make sure you have no conditions for rebirth. And what are these no conditions for rebirth? You must not have the four upadanas. If you do not have the four upadanas, you are a broken dependent origination. You are a broken dependent origination. You have no condition for bawa and jati. That means you will not be reborn. But as long as you have the four upadanas, craving attachment to sensual pleasures, craving attachment to views, craving attachment to rites and rituals, craving attachment to a self, you are going to be creating the conditions for becoming. Bawa is becoming. And after Bawa, Birth. All right. Okay. Oh, can can we re request the doctor you play the video? I think okay. That just give me a minute good. because I got to yes. look for it. Okay. Ah, it's it's in my enough. file here. Okay. With what you mentioned about the video, I'm sure okay. many of them are waiting out there. <laughs> now, let me go through that process again. Share video file. Dhamma. Uh, Death. Okay, found it and uh, Peter Mac, Peter Mac. Hang on, let me drag it out. It's, it's easier if I drag it out. Okay, let me just cancel it. Let me just drag it out uh, so that it's easier. Okay, I dragged out the file, so it's easier. Share, video file, hit the Mac. Why does it not respond? 
It's a WMV file, but it's not responding. And I click oh. on it. Let me try and share screen instead. It, it doesn't respond. Share, share screen, application, brave. I am sorry, but that you see the the file doesn't appear. You know, I think StreamYard probably cannot play it. See, it doesn't appear. It's here, but it does not appear. And when I click application, also the thing doesn't appear. Okay. So I think StreamYard probably cannot play that file. All right. All right I apologize. All right. No problem. Maybe it's not compatible. Yeah. All right. Not compatible. Uh, Okay, my brother, so is there a further question? Let's see. What do you, I can do is I'll, brother Chuan, I'll send the yeah. whole folder over to you all and see what all magic right. you all can do to show the audience. Because you all can right. still check it onto your your YouTube channel in the yeah. okay. all SBGA. Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, all right. Let me see. Uh, oh, maybe I can uh, have this uh, question. Is uh, there's a question from Brother J? Uh, okay, the one question comes in. All right, doctor. If someone is in coma, do we ask him to let go or do we ask him to wake up? <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, a lot of patients are in coma or sometimes in ICU, they are not in coma, but they have to be sedated. I mean, if you have ventilator, blah, 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 and you're not sedated, it's extremely uncomfortable. So most of the time they are sedated. Or of course, some are truly in coma. Now, we know that if you are sedated or you are in so-called coma, one of the last senses to go is the sense of hearing. And that's why in intensive care, very often you have patients we actually hear what we are saying. So one of the things we do, of course, when we are visiting in someone who is ill in ICU or very ill, is that you speak softly to his ears. And one, he may actually physically hear you because his sedation is light. Or two, it is believed that even people in coma is able to sense your sensation, your feelings of love, your feelings of compassion and care. They can actually sense it. So in that sense, no, 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 don't wake him up from coma. Let him come up naturally if he's to recover. Don't go and ship him and say, don't die, don't die, wake up, you know. You're even going to cause more distress. But what we realize is you can still talk to someone who is in coma or sedated like you talk to any other person. And of course, in ICU setting, please do it gently. Don't shout. Go near to his ear and whisper to him gently. And it may help him. And that is the usual advice we will give to people. All right? All right. Okay, we have the next question here. Uh, okay, please explain more on the term Sada, as I mentioned. Uh, right to understand that Sada means faith in Buddhism, basically, like what you mentioned earlier. Yeah. The word faith is a poor translation. Faith means believing in the unknown. That's why we say a leap of faith. Faith means believing in what I tell you. Faith means believing that if you believe in me, I will save you. You have no proof that I will save you, but you have faith in me that I will save you. That is faith. But that is not what is meant when used in the Dhamma. The word sada means more than this word faith. In fact, in one verse in the Dhammapada, there is a word being used called asada. That means the opposite of faith. And that word asada means you do not have blind belief in anything. The Buddha certainly does not encourage a blind belief in him. One example, once the Buddha was teaching and Sariputta was sitting right at his feet, listening. 
And at the end of the discourse, the Buddha asked Sariputta, do you believe in what I just told? Sariputta stood up, paid respect and said, no. Now, any other religion, they would have excommunicated Sariputta for such disrespect. But instead, the Buddha praised him because Sariputta said, no. He said, I will not believe until I have verified it by myself. And the Buddha actually praised Sariputta and said, this is the correct thing. So, sadha does not mean the blind faith or the leap of faith or the belief in the unknown that is seen in other philosophies or religions, for example. So, Sister Janet, I can tell you that Janet, you have got two arms and two legs. If Janet believes me, that is faith in me, that you have got two arms and two legs. But Janet can look and say, hey, really, I have two arms and I've got two legs. So now you do not have to believe in me. You know. You know that you have got two arms and two legs. You need not have faith in me anymore. So now what do you have in me instead? You have confidence that what I had taught you earlier is correct, verified by your own experience. Now you do not need to have faith in me, but you have confidence. Now you have sadha in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. You do not have blind faith in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, but you have confidence that what the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha teaches you is correct because it is verifiable. You can see it yourself. All right, it is timeless. It is immediately applicable. It is known by the wise. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. We let we would like to have uh, one final question. Ah, uh, are we as Dharma practitioners supposed to die at a mindful state of mind instead of being drugged or sedated? Yes, Brother Chan. The ideal situation, if you had created the causes and conditions for it, is to die in a mindful state, is to die with your faculties intact, is to die without tubes here, tubes there, mm -hmm. die without in, being intubated, folase catheter here, and all kinds of things being done. That is the ideal. That means you die at home, surrounded by your loved ones, with a Buddha image next to you, with your favorite sutta next to you, with all your kayana meters surrounding you and telling you, Buddhang Saranang Gachami, and then mentally you go through it. That is the ideal. And if you have that ideal situation, perfect. But the world is anatta. We cannot control that world. You cannot even control your own body, let alone that world. So let's say you do not have that auspicious condition and you have a rather painful state okay it could be so many different painful states okay and you need pain relief so you'll be sedated or you'll be given some kind of painful pain relief drugs which leaves you less mindful but that is still better than saying i am so sorry ah huh? this is your karma huh? you tolerate the pain Okay, because that pain is going to first make you, what a stupid doctor this is. I'm in pain and he's telling me this is your karma. Please tolerate your pain. You know which idiot university do you graduate from? So we do not want you to have a um, distressed mind. I can tell you when you are in pain and I go there and I say, brother, I'm going to give you this and this is going to relieve your pain. You are going to look at me and say, this is the person I am so grateful to. And until you have pain, you will not realize it. I will tell you, think of your last toothache. We all hate dentists. But when you have a toothache, suddenly you fall in love with that man because you need that man to relieve you. Now think of a painful cancer or a painful condition as a rather prolonged toothache. And then you will be grateful for the relief. So what is that relief? That relief takes away the negativity in your mind. Yes, you will not be so alert. You are not going to be so sharp. 
but at least we had taken away a cause of negativity in your mind. And as I said earlier, we are only, Sao Mei is only sedating your hardware. Sao Mei cannot sedate your software. When you had transited, the instant you had transited, even for people who have all kinds of illnesses, they are suddenly back in their state of mind. So if they are a trained practitioner who is very calm, very still, they are back there. Or if they are very loving, they are back there. And of course, if you are ang angry, revengeful, lustful, you are also back there. So it is not so much that sedation, but what we are doing all this time now. What is your mind state even now as we speak, tomorrow, day after, which is really the important one. As I said, a life well lived, not just I say, a, while, a life well lived, you do not have to worry about that last few moments. Because remember when, Dr., uh, when the Buddha was talking to Mahanama, his cousin, or I'm not sure, sure whether cousin or relative, Mahanama was literally worried about what you just said, almost along the same lines. And the Buddha assured him that you who have been practicing, you don't have to worry about this. All right, don't worry about this. This is something, if a bad person dies, yes, we worry. If a good person dies, there's nothing good. Okay? Thank you, Brother John. Thank you very much. Thank you, this. Thank you, Doctor, for that uh, very interesting talk. I would say, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Well, it has been a wonderful evening listening to such enlightening Dharma sharing. We have learned so much. Am I reborn, reincarnated, or recycled? Thank you, Dr. Puna Wong, again, to the uh, Dharma sharing and having a good explanation during the Q&A session. Please help me to thank our speaker, Dr. Puna Wong, and to also thank to those who have sent your comments and well wishes over to the comments. Thank you to those who have been working behind the scene, preparing the materials, having trials and extras, etc., etc. 